Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Alt24 News live from Algiers. Coming up next, now World News Program. Reports say Kabori's detention comes after troops staged mutinies at several army barracks and gunfire was heard near the president's residence. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell has invited U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to attend the meeting of the EU Foreign Affairs Council today, January the 24th, to focus on the situation in Ukraine. Also coming up in our world news program, Lebanon's government met on the budget today for the first time in more than three months as the talks with the International Monetary Fund about the country's economic meltdown were poised to resume. Fighting is still ongoing in Syria between the so-called ISIS and Kurdish troops as the organization stormed a jail harboring extremists according to a monitor in bloodshed that has claimed over 50 or 80 lives. And President of the Republic, Adel Majid Taboon, arrives to Egypt today, Monday, for a two-day working and fraternal visit. Thank you for joining us. President of the Republic, Abdel Majid Taboon, arrived today, Monday, to Egypt for a two-day working visit and fraternal visit as well. The Algerian president's visit to Cairo comes after the one that led him to Tunisia mid-December and a few days after the Arab tour that Algerian Foreign Minister Ramtan Lamamra made to Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, Cairo and Doha as part of Algeria's preparations for the upcoming Arab summit. Algerian president Abdel Majid Taboon's visit coincides with Cairo's proposing an initiative to establish regional industrial integration between Algeria and Egypt in the context of implementing the terms of the African Free Trade Organization Agreement at a time when the two countries aspire to raise their trade exchanges to $2 billion within the next two years. Now, residents said that heavy gunfire were heard late Sunday in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso, near the residence of President Roche Kabori. Marwa Belayro reports. Shots have been heard near the presidential palace in Burkina Faso's capital, Ouagadougou, amid the mutiny by soldiers. Gunfire has also been heard at several quarters in the capital, with soldiers demanding the sacking of military chiefs and more resources to fight terrorists. Demonstrators supported the rebels and set up makeshift roadblocks in several avenues, before being dispressed by the police, which forced authorities to introduce a nighttime curfew. Government dismissed rumors of a new coup attempt just over a week after 11 soldiers were detained for allegedly plotting a coup. Defense Minister said on nationwide TV that none of the Republic's institution has been troubled by the revolt and that there were localized limited incidents in a few barracks and that he was investigating. The government has confidence in the army which remains committed to the Republic. We ask people to remain calm, to carry out their duties. We are following the developing situation so we can provide an information on the real reasons for these shootings. So I can tell you that, for the moment, everything is under control. And we ask our army to continue to support the Republic and carry out the missions to protect the territory and its people. The location of President Rock Kaburi is unclear, but the defense minister denied rumors circulating on social media that he was under arrest. It is the latest side of growing disconnect with President Kaburi's government over its failure to suppress the terrorist revolution that has devastated the West African state since 2015. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell has invited U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to attend the meeting of the EU Foreign Affairs Council today, January the 24th, to focus on the situation in Ukraine. This year's first meeting of the Foreign Affairs Council, which will bring together the foreign ministers of the EU's 27 member states, will be held in Brussels. The Ukraine issue is expected to dominate the meeting. Uh, we are not going to do the same thing because we don't know any specific reasons. But uh, Secretary Lincoln 
will inform us, and I don't think we have to dramatize as far as the negotiations are going on, and they are going on. I don't think uh, that we have to let to train and, and leave. But maybe Secretary Blinken has more information to, he will share with us. The United Arab Emirates intercepted two missiles launched by the Iran-allied Houthi rebels in Yemen. Its official news agency said on Monday, one week after a deadly strike by the group killed three people in Abu Dhabi. Parts of the missiles fell over Abu Dhabi and did not cause any casualties, but the attack highlighted the growing threat from the Houthis, who have targeted neighboring Saudi Arabia for years with missile and drone strikes. Lebanon's government met on the budget today for the first time in more than three months as talks with the International Monetary Fund about the country's economic meltdown were poised to resume. The developments were aimed at controlling Lebanon's worst economic crisis in its history. The cabinet meeting at the presidential palace was held after the powerful Hezbollah and its main Shiite ally ended their boycott and were poised to participate in the design of a recovery plan. According to a monitor, fighting is still ongoing in Syria between the so-called ISIS and Kurdish troops as the terrorist organization stormed a jail harboring extremists in bloodshed that has claimed over 80 lives. Sofian Kintori reports. A fight has erupted in northeastern Syria between the Kurdish-dominated Syrian Democratic Forces and the so-called ISIL following an attack on jail housing members of militant organization. The situation there is catastrophic. More than 120 people have killed in these ongoing battles. Over 80 members of the so-called ISIL and more than 40 Kurdish fighters, including internal security forces. On Thursday, the so-called ISIS raided the Kurdish-run jail in northeast Syria, liberating senior militants, according to a war monitor, who did not specify how many fled. Before the so-called ISIS terrorist assaulted Kurdish security personnel stationed, at the Guayran jail, one of the largest facilities housing the so-called ISIS fighters in the northeast Syria, where a vehicle bomb was detonated at the prison entrance and a second device was detonated nearby. The Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces confirmed the rare attack on prison in statement, but did not mention any prisoners fleeing. <laughs> A Taliban delegation led by acting Foreign Minister Amir Khan Mikati started on Sunday three days of talks in Oslo with Western officials and Afghan civil society representatives amid a deteriorating humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. The closed-door meetings were taking place at a hotel in the snow-capped mountains above the Norwegian capital and are the first time since the Taliban took over in August that their representatives have held official meetings in Europe. US, the, in the U.S., thousands of anti-vaccination demonstrators from throughout the country gathered on the nation's capital on Sunday for a march against vaccine mandates, including some of the anti-vaccination movement's biggest stars. Sofian Kintori again. The crowd on National Mall, nearly two years into the coronavirus pandemic that has killed more than 860,000 Americans, was a startling sight. A crowd of demonstrators, many unmasked, decrying vaccine mandates in the middle of the city that has adopted masks and vaccine mandates to reduce sickness and death from the virus Omicron variant, which has ravaged D.C. for weeks. Three young kids, or we have three young kids, and uh, we're just not comfortable with injecting them with an experimental therapeutic. It hasn't gone through the tests that normal vaccines would have gone through. Uh, also, our sister, unfortunately, was required by her job to be vaccinated. She's a single mom, and she made the decision, and now she has a permanent heart condition due to that, so she'll be on medication. According to a permit given by National Park Service, organizers predicted that 20,000 people would join the event, which would march from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial. And by early Sunday afternoon, a smaller crowd of several thousand had gathered on the mall. So I'm not against vaccines that have been studied and work, but things that, that don't work and, and aren't studied um, shouldn't be put in your body, especially if you're young and healthy. Uh, if you're older and you're compromised, that's your choice. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're at that age where you can make that choice. You know, But again, people shouldn't be forced to do these things. We should have a choice. 
vaccines are mass murder bio weapons, and Trump won, were among the misleading statements carried by the protesters on posters and flags. A bus was parked outside the Washington Monument with the rest or exile, placards and photographs of Anthony S. Fossey and Bill Gates, the latter reference to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about the Rothschild family. Still with the same story, but with some pretty good news here, the COVID-19 pandemic is approaching its end game in Europe due to the milder Omicron variant, a World Health chief has said. Hans Klatsch, the World Health Organization's Europe director, believes there will be soon be global immunity thanks to the vaccine rollout and natural infection. Towards a kind of a pandemic endgame, not an endgame of the COVID-19, but a pandemic endgame. Once that the Omicron wave will subside, there will be for quite some weeks and months a global immunity, either thanks to the vaccine or because people have immunity due to the infection and also lowering seasonality. So there will be a period of quiet before the COVID-19 may come back towards end of the year but not necessarily the pandemic coming back. Italian parliamentarians will begin casting their votes for a new president today, Monday. More than 1,000 lawmakers and re regional delegates will participate in the complex secret ballot. The general elections come just after Silvio Berlusconi decided to withdraw from the elections. More with Nabil Khazini. In Italy, a thousand senators, deputies and regional representatives begin to vote to designate the future tenant of the Quirinal Palace in Rome. A vote that can last several days. Former Prime Minister in four terms Silvio Berlusconi, 85 years, abandoned his dream of becoming the next head of state and decided to withdraw only 24 hours before the elections begin. While Mario Draghi, who has been credited with restoring stability in Italian politics, is seen as the most favorite, even if broad support is not guaranteed. Over fears his move to the presidential palace could trigger early elections. We have accomplished what we were called on to do. I'm a man and a grandfather, if you like, at the service of institutions. So Draghi will be elected only if there's an agreement uh, on the uh, future of the government. Current President Sergio Mattarella is perceived to be the uniting political force in Italy. In his 80 years, he shows no interest to stay in office. However, there is a chance he could remain in place. We all wish our President Mattarella will just stay in office for another term. Apparently, the three men have gained the most public attention in Italy. But Marta Cartabia, Italian Justice Minister, also decided to talk to the polls. If Cartabia is elected, she will be the first Italian female to become head of state. The president in Italy is elected by an electoral college compromising 1,009 people. It is made of members of the two chambers of parliament, 630 MPs and 321 senators, in addition to 58 delegates of Italy's regions. The president term lasts for seven years. In the first three rounds of voting, the winner must secure at least a two-thirds majority. From the fourth round, an absolute majority is enough. In Portugal, early voting has begun a week ahead of the country's national elections. The early voting option was introduced to avoid overcrowding on the day itself due to the pandemic. An estimated number of 600,000 people are currently in quarantine in Portugal. But voters who are infected and in isolation, on the other hand, will be allowed to leave home to cast their ballot next week on January the 30th, the official election date. And for more world news, let's follow this report by Marwa Bilaywar. Jordan activists gathered outside the Ukrainian embassy in Tbilisi on January 23rd to demonstrate their solidarity with Ukraine amid Russia's military buildup. The rally was also joined by Ukrainians and Belarusians based in Georgia. The protesters urged the Georgian government to send a clear message of solidarity with Ukraine. About 20% of Georgian territory is held by breakaway regions controlled by Russia.
Armenian President Armen Sarkisyan announced his resignation, citing his inability to influence the political life of his country. Sarkisyan said in a statement posted on his official website that the president does not have the necessary tools to influence the radical possessors of domestic and foreign policy in these difficult times for the country and the nation. This comes as the Armenian president is at the center of a political crisis following an outbreak of fighting between Armenia and neighbor Azerbaijan over control of the Nagorno-Karabakh region. On Sunday, a total of 39 People's Liberation Army airplanes came into Taiwan's air defense zone, causing the island's air force to scramble jets and fire missiles in an attempt to scatter them. According to Taiwan's defense ministry, the airplanes include 34 fighter jets, four electronic warfare planes and a bomber. The the United States has ordered families of diplomats and all American personnel at the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine to leave the country, saying that Russia could decide to invade at any time. State Department officials stress the Kyiv embassy will remain open and that the announcement does not constitute an evacuation. The decision came amid rising tensions about Russia's military buildup on the Ukraine border that were not eased during talks Friday between Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. And now it's time for some economic news around the world in this report by Nabil Khazini. Speaking at the Virtual World Economic Forum held instead of the normal in-person gathering at Davis, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the International Monetary Fund, announced that the global economy would have to face an obstacle course in 2022 amid the ongoing pandemic effects and the geopolitical tensions that are deepening the global inflation problem. The IMF had added that the pressure on prices is a very complicated story in which there is also an element of geopolitical tensions. Fortescue, the mining giant founded by Australia's richest man, has decided to pay a big price to get its hands on battery technology produced by the Williams Formula One racing team for $222.2 million. The deal aims to help Fortescue's become a green company and to achieve its target to become carbon neutral by 2030. The company also aims to develop trains' batteries. Africa's richest man, the Nigerian Aliko Dangote, saw his fortune grow by $1.3 billion in less than a month on the back of a surge in the shape price of his cement company. According to Bloomberg's Billionaires Index, the wealth of Africa's richest man at $20.4 billion now approaches the value of the economy of the entire nation of Senegal. An estimated of as many as 750,000 subscribers in the United Kingdom could abandon Netflix after the rise to top series reverted to owners Disney. According to Ampere analysis, Netflix remains the UK's most popular streaming service, with an estimated 14 million subscribers at the close of 2021. Amazon Prime Videos holds 12.3 million and Disney 4.7 million. And uh, French designer Manfred Thierry Magler, who helped define 80s power dressing, launched the phenomenon of celebrities as models and introduced a new fragrance category with Angel, has died at the age of 73. And finally, a veteran Yusuf al Msekni scored to give previously an impressive Tunisia a 1-0 victory over Nigeria in the Africa Cup of Nations last 16 match in Guara. Yesterday, Nigeria had a good chance to level at the start of added time when substitute Omar Sadiq got behind the defence and fired across goalkeeper Bashir bin Said, only to see his shot trickle wide of the far post. The North Africans will now meet Burkina Faso, who eliminated Gabon in a penalty shootout in the quarter-finals of Africa's premier competition next Saturday. And now it's time to have a look again to our main top stories. Reports say Kabori's detention comes after troops staged mutinies at several army barracks and gunfire was heard near the president's residence. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell has invited U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to attend the meeting of the EU Foreign Affairs Council today, January the 24th, to focus on the situation in Ukraine.
Lebanon's government met on the budget today for the first time in more than three months as talks with the International Monetary Fund about the country's economic meltdown were poised to resume. Fighting is still ongoing in Syria between the so-called ISIS and Kurdish troops as the organization stormed the jail harboring extremists, according to a minute monitor in bloodshed that has claimed over 80 lives. And President of the Republic, Abdel Majid Taboun, arrives to Egypt to today, Monday, for a two-day working and fraternal visit. That's all for me and the rest of the team. The news continues on L24 News. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.